in Luke, I believe it's chapter 1, <clears throat> where, um, where the scripture says, and nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. The word nothing there is actually two different words. It's not one word like in English. It's the word no, but it's the word rhema. Rhema, there's rhema and logos in, uh, in the scripture, two words that are translated word. Rhema is generally used to describe a freshly spoken word of God. So something that God speaks freshly in that moment. <clears throat> so when it says nothing is impossible, it's saying no freshly spoken word of God is impossible. When you look at the word impossible, it means without ability. It can be translated like this. This is the implication of the verse. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. It's for that reason in James 1, it says, in humility, receive the word implanted. Picture the heart now as soil. When the heart is tender, it says, okay, in humility, that's tenderness of heart. In humility, receive the word, which is seed, the sperma of God. All right? In humility, receive the word implanted. And then the next phrase is, which is able to save your souls. What is it saying there? The word has the ability to save, heal, and deliver. All right? So in humility, make sure that your heart always carries the atmosphere to receive whatever it is that God is saying. Why? Because once the word is in there, it brings about its own effect. But out of John 6, where the disciples were baffled, uh, the crowd was baffled by the teaching that Jesus gave when he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and the, the crowds left him. Uh, he started with a crowd of, say, 10, 12,000 people, and he ended up with 12 disciples. And so he's teaching a group of people. The first layer left early in the message because Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They were offended at that, got ticked off. So he's, he, he intensified the word because he needed to offend a few more. And he said, all right, not only is my, am I the bread that comes down from heaven, you're gonna have to eat that bread. So it created a greater argument and he still needed to offend a few more, so he says, all right, this is the way it works. You're gonna have to eat my flesh and you're gonna have to drink my blood. That was the last straw because they could eat the flesh of an animal, but they could never even drink the blood of an animal. And Jesus says, all right, not only are you gonna have to eat my flesh, you're gonna have to drink my blood. And at that point, they just, this is a hard saying, and even the disciples that had followed him for quite a while left. Jesus gives us a clue in verse, uh, somewhere around 61, 62, he says, he said, my words to you, Jesus is talking to his disciples now because he watches the crowd go. The disciples, you can see, you can picture the 12 sitting there going, man, we were the most popular guys on the planet two hours ago before Jesus brought this weird sermon, telling everybody they had to eat him and drink him, you know. And, uh, and they're watching the crowd vanish. They're watching the people. That he, Jesus just multiplied the food, loaves and fishes for this crowd. He's healed their sick. They've been with him for an extended period of time. And they've been stunned for quite a while. And now the disciples are watching everybody leave. And Jesus turns and he says, my words to you are spirit and they are life. Now, where did this sermon come from that brought confusion and offense to everybody? From the Father. How do we know that? Jesus only said what he heard his father say. All right. So here's a message that nobody understood. Where did it come from? The Father. Why? Martin hit it Sunday night, for those of you that were here, it's a profound statement he made. He said, Sunday night, he said, he said um, I talked about reading the book of Revelation. And he says, many people read the book of Revelation thinking they're supposed to understand it. But I think it's in verse uh, four or five, the scripture says, blessed are those who read these words. It doesn't say understand. Because when you expose yourself to truth, you have to remember now your spirit is alive and your spirit gets a whole lot more than your brain does. And if you don't feed yourself on stuff that is Holy Spirit food, you only feed stuff 
that you understand, then you've stunted your own spiritual growth. When you only nod your head to things, you know, when you only say amen to things that, that you comprehend, then you've just decided to live a, a, a very dwarfed spiritual life. Because then what you're doing is you fashioned a God who looks much like you because he's one you can comprehend. So he says, blessed are they who read these words. So here's the deal, is that we work to maintain the right heart. The heart is the one of humility. You know, it's, it's not a humble heart because you work hard to be humble. It's a humble heart because you prefer others. Oftentimes, attempts to be humble are too self-focused to ever get there. It's just better to put others first. It's just better to serve. Tenderness of heart is seen by the willingness to do whatever God says. It's, the, it's flexible. It's, it's something that's tender, pliable, movable. It, uh, it responds to presence. It responds to words that have life. So Jesus says here in this chapter where the crowds just have vanished and he's left with 12, he says, my words to your spirit and they are life. So he turns to Peter after the crowds have left, or he turns to the 12, and he says, are you going to go too? And Peter said, and this is one of his most classic statements that Peter made, he nailed this one. He said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. What is he saying? He's saying, Jesus, all we know is that when you talk, we come alive inside. He had learned to recognize the life on a word he couldn't understand. Many will only obey when they understand. And the Lord is looking for people that will just do what he says. What is the point I'm trying to make? I hope you're getting it. Is that the, the disciples, the 12, had become fixated, if you will, on the fact that whenever Jesus talked, they found out why they were alive. They didn't understand everything he said. In fact, you see, him, you see them often taking him aside asking questions. How come we couldn't cast the demon out? And you, you stepped right in and did it. What did you mean? We don't understand what you mean by this, this uh, soil thing. How, you know, it makes no sense to us. And, and so Jesus would constantly explain. So they're, they live a life where they don't understand a lot. And they've embraced that as a lifestyle. And they've been willing to say yes. It's a huge part of the Christian life. Is saying yes First of all, it's being able to recognize when God is speaking, even though you don't understand what he's saying. There's a big challenge. Because most of us process stuff through our own intellect to reason whether or not this is from God. Which, which just means we, we end up with a God who looks like us. All right. You all right? Okay. In verse 10, his disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. All right, just follow this through for a moment. It was given to his disciples to know the mysteries, and yet they were clueless when he was through and didn't understand what he said. How many of you have been reading this scripture and a verse just jumps out at you, but you couldn't explain it to another person if your life depended on it? All right, all right. That's what I'm talking about. You're reading, I, I remember one of my first experiences with this. I was reading through Isaiah 62 and I was just reading through this passage and it just leapt out at me. My heart just went, wow! And I just feasted on this thing. I don't have a clue what he's trying to say, but, but it made me so happy to read it. Does that make sense to you? You've had that happen? What's happening? Your spirit man is learning. So what do you do? You keep yourself exposed because your spirit man is learning. Eventually, your, the Holy Spirit ministers to your spirit. Holy Spirit lives in your spirit. In that context, they teach your mind what to think. That's how you come into a renewed mind. We tend to think you get revelation in the mind and then it affects the spirit. Now that's the carnal Christian life because that's the soul in charge of the spirit. The mind is important. It's vital. God's not intimidated by an intellect at all. He values the mind. The mind is so important, Jesus gave his life to protect your mind and the freedom that you have to think for yourself. And what sin does is it makes you robots. Sin makes you robots because it restricts all your choices to an evil nature. 